Hello and welcome to the new Spiro podcast where we interview experts, authorities and characters on all things spearfishing. Come and join us after the show at noobspiro.com, the online spearfishing community helping you to become a better Spiro. Here are your hosts for the show, Shrek and Turbo. G'day, Noob Spiro community. Today we're chatting with a very experienced Sydney Spiro. He uh, began spearing with his father, Rick, in about 1976 around the rocks of Balmoral Beach in Sydney. By age 10, he had speared South Solitary Island and he become hooked. Simon, is it trip or tripe, Simon? Oh, come on, mate. It's trip. Fall over. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Simon tripped over and joined the San Susi Dolphin Spearfishing Club. He's been active in various roles, boards and committees to ensure Spiro's rights are enhanced here in Australia. Simon's also the USFA Sports Secretary. He's certified apnea instructor with the Australian Spearfishing Academy. And he voluntarily gives his time to deliver safety and ethics classes to Spiro up and down the coast. Fantastic. Hey, Simon, it's Turbo here, mate. Hello, mate. Just uh, if we could get a little bit of information on um, where you started your, your spearfishing career. Yeah, look, mate, um, my father, Rick, as you heard, he, was, he still is a mad keen Spiro. He's crazy. He dives Darwin, filthy water, thinks nothing of it, loves it amongst the crocs. And I'll tell you a story about that later with myself and him and a crocodile. In Sydney, diving at Balmoral Beach as a young kid, Dad always ended up around near the nude beach there for some reason. We got out there and said hi to everybody, <laughs> a few fish and offering fish to all the girls. He was a classic, I'll clean them for you or Simon will clean them for you and he kept chatting away. It was interesting <laughs> to say the least as a young guy. And I can remember we went to Vanuatu for holidays and I was diving there, the Isle of Pines, and it was just crystal clear and seeing fish left the sewerage of middle head, you know, for dead. <laughs> then we came back and Dad found an excuse to go up to the solitaries, which he's always had a love affair with. We were in pubs then and there was a keg strike and Dad needed to get some beer, he told my mum. So we drove up there with a good mate and a, uh, an empty trailer, filled it up with kegs and while we were there we slipped in a dive and we dive with a legend called Sid Harvey. He's an Australian representative in his day and he's a professional fisherman then and he took us to South Solitary and a few of his pet spots and, yeah, I, I got, a, got my first red Maui there and that was an achievement. And I was just oh, pumped, God. saw some massive grain earth sharks or, you know, a couple of whalers and things like that. And it was just adrenaline coursing through me. You know, back then, I couldn't hold my breath for 10 seconds. It's probably about five seconds better now today. But it just got me fired up. I, I loved it. Coming back to Sydney at school, I got a heap of mates hook, hooked into it. I did a talk and a presentation in my English class on spearfishing with a good mate of mine, and he's still a great mate of mine today. We still spear. He lives in Coffs, um, Andy Davis, and look. On the bus on Sundays, we'd have up to 14, 15 guys on the bus all trekking out to from Redfern out to Coogee Beach. There's an island off wow. there that we used to go nuts on and terrorise the local Maui population. And Occasionally, we'd get a nice fish. Yeah, mate, so it was good. The gear we had, mate, was just all hand-me-downs. I was in the club then. Um, Dad had moved to Darwin. I was 12, 13. And it's the San, the San Susi? Yeah, club. yeah, mate. There's a, I've got a lot of sort of uncles you could say, and big brothers that looked after you and uh, scrounge, you know, a wetsuit hood from one of them and a, a pair of torn out wetsuit shorts and we'd be wearing sloppy joes. We really were, you know, a couple of jumpers over us to, um, to keep us warm. You know, we were literally using rope for weight belts and, and a couple awesome. of leads and oh, it was just fantastic, you know, and the old guns we were using are collector's items now, you know, just stuff that the you know, old, older guys had in the shed they weren't using anymore, things like Turnbulls and stuff like that just aren't around. Using little black void fins, swimming out the wedding cake island. It was quite a feat. It was, um, yeah. yeah, good days, good days, and they were great days. So I've, I've, I think back a lot, a lot of rock hopping. Sounds like a pretty tight knit family sort of club back in those days, Simon. Is it still like that these days? Yeah, mate. Look, it's a good question. Back then and before we started recording, we were talking about the sort of a bit of brotherhood. It was only a small club, the Dolphins. We're lucky to have you know, 20 blokes all up and maybe 10 guys would go to a meeting, but all, all the thick as thieves and knowing each other through the 60s and 70s and then into the 80s and some were young, some were older, obviously. But now my club, we worked out, we were getting guys coming and wanting to spearfish and it was just, we were, I don't know, hard. And we worked out 
15 years ago, we're only keeping one in eight guys that had come to the club. I think we're scaring them all wow. the way, We'd take them out the boat, they'd vomit everywhere, and we'd say, look, at the dash, <laughs> there's two concrete pills, mate, harden up. Yeah. And we're wondering, hey, he never came back to, to for another dive. He was a nice guy. What happened to him? <laughs> I like that so, guy. Yeah, <laughs> what went wrong? And we did a big survey and we asked a lot of questions to guys and we tracked down a few guys that did come. A lot of them had big egos and thought they could, you know, shoot, shit, electrocute, et cetera, and they just they weren't up to it. And I think they were embarrassed as well, you know, big notice. But, you know, it cut the wheat from the chaff and we wanted a lot more. And so we dropped a lot of our bravado, I think, amongst yeah. the boys. And now, look, we've got over 120 social members in the club. Wow. The club's massive. At a meeting, we get you know, anywhere from 30 to 70 guys come to a meeting. It's, it's so fantastic and knowledge all over the place and new guys coming all the time and, and they're like sponges. It's great. We tell them, you know, just come up and annoy us. People direct them over to me and if they've got a Bundy in their hand, I'm happy to talk to them. You know, it's great. The Bundy's <laughs> for me. But, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, obviously. Hey, do, do you guys run some sort of uh, induction for these guys or do you encourage them to get into a, an entry-level course or what's the story to, to get such a, a high retention rate of these new people coming in the door? Look, what it is is I think we don't push membership. Um, we allow them to come in. We have a barbie. It's very social. There's a bar at the fishing club where we're at, where we meet, and it's just we're just friendly. We, we designated, you know, maybe – half a dozen mentors in the club and we're still doing it today, pulling out blokes and say, you've been here long enough, you're capable, you're not a, you know, you know, you're not an idiot. Next meeting, two new guys, you grab them, you talk to them, yeah, they're yours, you choose them and and look after them. And it's great now, we've got quite a few guys who've got boats and they're able, and boats talk, you know, if you've got a boat, you can take guys out and guys love that, the whole experience of going out in a boat as well. Rock hopping's mighty fine in Sydney, we're lucky, you can rock hop just about anywhere on Sydney's coastline. We got the feedback from guys. You know, one guy practically hugged me. He brought his son along after he was there for a year. He was a teenager and said, mate, straight my boy out. Let's take him diving. I said, for sure. And he's hugging me and said, I've learned more spearfishing in a year and a half with you guys than what I've learned with 10 years diving with my mates. Oh, and, wow, that's a, that's, a, that's a great success. Yeah, it is, mate. And that's, that's the thing with the club. And we get so many new guys say that. Um, before we were very close, guarded, you know, no one to share a cray hole and no one to take blokes for a dewy. But it just got ridiculous. Come on, let's get these guys first. And when you share, you only get your first once, you know, your first dewy, your first kingy, your yeah. first red. And then that's cool. And you get more and you can get bigger and better PBs, but your first one you always bloody remember. Um, yeah, definitely. And, and I'm greedy now. If I share that with somebody else that gets there first, I'm claiming the stoke with them. It's great. So a lot yeah. of us have realised that it's it's good yeah. to share that. That's, that's the big buzz what? of the dive. Yeah, we, we recently took out a, uh, a guy staying with us from Argentina and uh, we took him out for the day and he, he shot his, his first fish ever. He shot a Maui and he was absolutely stoked, this guy. He couldn't believe it. So yeah. he, he's, he's plastered all over Facebook in, in, in Spanish. I think he's uh, Argentina's finest Spiro. <laughs> <laughs> And mate, we've you, you can't knock Yeah, we've had that experience a few times now, Simon, and it, and it is special. It's almost as good as shooting your own first yeah, fish of that species, is, helping mate. someone else do it. Yeah. You just can't knock enthusiasm. So long as they don't shoot a bigger fish than yours, they're all right in my boat. They're fine, mate. <laughs> One of our other friends, we recently started a, a bit of an antic on the boat where the newest guy on the boat, regardless of what fish he shoots on the day, um, at the end of the trip, he has to hold up the fish that the other guys delegate to him. <laughs> So, so, so lately we've been shooting, um, you know, less illustrious fish just so he's got something to take home and have some uh, perhaps not so illustrious photos to uh, put up on his Facebook wall. But but we've been enjoying little rituals like that. I think that's what, what makes, uh, you know, like a good club environment successful, um, Simon. And, and it sounds like you guys have got a lot a lot more of that going on down there. Yeah, mate, we, we, have, we have a lot of fun. We make it a lot of fun. We have trips away always up and down the coast from Eden you know, up to Coffs Harbour, Woolai, yeah, um, awesome. big weekends. They're, they're great. We plan the months ahead, get out there and we, you know, guys who have shot, you know, umpteen kingies or whatever, they they go out of the way to get the new blokes a kingie and once that's done, then they'll go and, you know, find a fish themselves. And the, the new guys appreciate it. They hang around and, and, it, and it's, you know, it's pay it back. 
you know, in another year or two, these guys have got a boat and they're, they're doing the same thing. It's a great culture in the club. It's fantastic. Mm. I was just going to say, it sounds like a great culture. That's, that's awesome. Uh, right. <laughs> Simon, we um, we have a, a question that we, we, we like to ask and uh, you mentioned – before you had a story about a, a, a crocodile story from um, from up north. Oh, mate, yeah. When I was a young bloke, I, I moved up to Darwin to live just out of school and get some more lessons in life. And I'd had a good day on the punt and went to the casino, had a better <laughs> night to upbring. You know, partied on till whatever time in the morning, got home and I was living at my uh, grandparents' place and they lived right above Fanny Bay Beach. And it's a walk down there and you've got to stroll out about four or 500 metres to get to, you know, shin deep water, I suppose. Oh, wow. I've got this gun dog with me. Uh, Well, let me, hang on, I've jumped ahead for half an hour, but I'll keep the story one minute. But Rick's come in at whatever time in the morning go, quick, it's neat, it's high, let's go, let's go. And I'm going, get out of here, leave me alone. You know, I think I was experiencing my second ever hangover. It's disappeared. It had gone quiet. I've gone back to sleep. The next second, I'm jumping out of bed. I'm completely soaked. He threw a bucket of water on me <laughs> and he's bolted and he knew he'd, I'd chase him and I wanted to kill him. I've raced out the door. He's run straight across the road. I've still chased him across the road. Almost got collected by a car. And then he stopped and he's laughing his head off. And then I flew. He's, he's gone back, got all the dive gear, put it out on top of the rocks there. So it's just a walk down the cliff. He said, he's here now, look at the water's actually clean, let's go. So he got me. We've got down, we start walking across and I'm sweating bullets, you know. We haven't got wetsuits on or anything, but I'm passing out. The dog's right next to me and then the dog goes stiff and, you know, we're 500 metres from shore. And I'm starting to think I'm just going to crawl along until I get to the drop-off. But then when the dog went stiff, I sort of looked over to the side and here's the splash, splash, splash. It's a bloody saltwater croc, you know, two metres plus. Oh, just yeah. cruising past this, you know, wagging its tail and its snout as it's, you know, it's doing what I was just about to do. And I've gone, holy <laughs> crap. I yelled out, hey, Dad, look. And he's turned around and what? And he's gone, oh, good grief. And he stopped <laughs> and I stopped and it sort of cruised them between us and went up towards East Point. And I said, that's all I need. I'm going back to bed. And Rick's going, no, wait, wait, just wait. It's gone off. Come back. And he's, <laughs> like, I said, big salty. And I had to end up beating him off and drop the gear in the water and ran. So we had to get the gear. And Ugh. later that day, come on, let's go up there. And I said, that's where the croc went. No, 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 we'll be right. And at the 5.30 news on the NT News that night, it came up. They caught the bloody thing right where he wanted to go diving that afternoon. You know? So oh, yeah. he's a freak, Rick, and I've never forgotten that. It was just too funny. Um, yeah, the things you do, the stories you remember. Along with you, I guess that was one of your scariest moments out of spearfishing, was it? Oh, yeah, mate. I, was, I think I was too numb from the hangover to be too scared. It was more shock and going, what the? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've had, yeah we've all had some scary ones, yeah. What if you if you were going to share a story of your most memorable fish? What fish would you talk about? What story? Oh, mate, I've been sketching this all day. The wife's clipped me over the head three times to stop me from dra- daydreaming. <laughs> daydreaming, you idiot! You've got Go you've got a horde of good memories. Yeah, yeah, yeah drool's been that's coming out of the mouth. Not a red Maui, is it? Oh, mate, you know that that was special. Um, yeah. Fifty foot of viso off the front of South Solitary as a ten year old. It was awesome. Oh, yeah, Not that, that I was diving epic. fifty feet, but it was pretty clean. I think sharing um, my first good dog tooth. Um, I've yeah. shot some great fish in Sydney. The first of everything, but the dog tooth I'd done. I think it was my third Coral Sea trip and I hadn't got a, a, a doggy. And just, yeah. I'd had some horror stories with them and gear failure and sharks and everything. And then this, everyone was getting shark their fish off this point of Fallery's Passage off Marion Reef. And it yeah. was a particularly windy day, choppy, rough. Um, we got in the water. Um, I said to the boys, I'm not going to shoot anything except a dog tooth. As soon as I get in the water, you know, 25 kilo wahoo swims right up to me. Oh, I've gone, nice. damn. And I said, bugger this, you know, and I've, I'd shot my, I'd done umpteen coral sea trips as well, a couple and lost wahoo, but then got one in Sydney, which was a great first as well. I wanted one. 15 minutes later, Rick's passed up a wahoo about seven foot long. Oh, um, no, no, no. Literally, my mate's coming up from the bottom. I'm on the surface. 
and we're thinking this is going to be fantastic. We're just we're both watching this huge, big blue barred thing swimming past Rick in point blank range, and Rick didn't shoot it. Um, he's got his gun trained on it the whole time, and then he's pointed at it too late to start swimming, but the Wahoo spooked it. And we're both screaming at it at the same time, and I, I won't use obscenities what we said. And he's my father after all, and I'm embarrassing him enough as it is. And he looked at me and he said, but you said you were only going to shoot dog tooth, and that's just a dirty barracuda. And I, oh, man, I almost killed him. And just I was drowning laughing anyway. Sure enough, <laughs> 10 minutes later, some big doggies came in. I went down. I did everything right, swam away from the flasher. They came in on the flasher, swam back to the flasher. The dog tooth got interested. I chose a good one, plugged it. He took off. There were about four sharks following it disappeared, I freestyled after him. Two minutes later, I'm still heading in the direction of the float. Then it comes soaring back to me and there's about oh, 40 sharks following it. Wow. Um, yeah. I've grabbed hold of it. It's towing me. I'm slowly gaining ground. I'm pulling it up, pulling it up. Heaps of sharks and the mates, you know, my best mates right there. I told Rick to get in the boat and pull the anchor up because we used to anchor the dories back then. Unlike mm-hmm. we do now, we always have a boaty now for safety. And he's going, pull it up, man, pull it up. I'm going, no, no, it's all right. I've just got to get this right, you know. And he's there going, pull it up, it's going to get eaten. And it had little, you know, three-foot whalers, you know, rubbing their noses, their snouts along the, the flank of the fish. Yeah. And uh, I just thought, I've got to do this quickly. Called the boat right over next to me. Uh, and I thought, as soon as I grab the shaft, it'll wriggle and that'll set the sharks off. But I've, I've slipped it up, got it on the tail, hand up the gill, and just in one movement threw it into the boat. And it was beautiful, except yeah, then the, the dog tooth went bang, bang, bang in the tinny. And what we yeah. didn't see were all these massive silver tips on the bottom, you know, 50, yeah. 60 foot below us, and they just came up like Exocet missiles. And I've yeah. just dropped everything and, you know, jumped over the boat, and poor Andy still had a loaded gun and everything, and he just got <laughs> harassed. They just smashed him, and uh, he was climbing over, literally climbed over the bow of the dory. And uh, wow. it, was, it was a great experience um, <laughs> and high-fiving. And, yeah, mate, it was, you know, an average doggy, 30 kilos, but it was my first and it was over 30 and I was, it was just I was wrapped. It was very uh, special yeah. to the effort, that the awesome. time, effort, I'll, money. I'd be happy for it. Not, neither of us have shot doggies yet. I, I haven't got a Wahoo yet. Um, there's a lot, I've got a lot, lots of firsts to come yet for myself. No, nah, mate, you're laughing. I, uh, yeah. I wish I could have a clean page, mate, and start all over again. I envy the young blokes today, all the gear they've got, the technology that's behind them, all the learning they're getting now. You know, it took years. You know, I'm serious. You know, I'm doing trips up and down the coast and all the technique you learn and pick up along the way. And these guys just pick it up so quickly now. They're so lucky. One thing I was going to ask you is, um, have you done many trips away from Australia and, and what would be the best of them? And, and perhaps what, what would you recommend to people that are interested in travelling uh, from Australia? It's, or, it's, a, or elsewhere? it's a bloody good question you ask and it's something that I'm just about to write in my uh, piece I do for SDM magazine. I'm going to write a few hundred words on it about this, this is with Facebook and this, this whole exposure to international waters. Every man and his dog that, that does FIFO is, is going there, you know. They get that time off. They've cashed up the young blokes. They're not married. They haven't got kids. And they're just in Indo. And then next they're in French Polynesia shooting 109-kilo dog tooth, you know. Yeah, they shot yeah, a two kilo Wahoo the other day. I still this love is you, John. This is John Pengelly. Yeah, yeah I, I still love you, John. I don't hate you, mate. Yeah, it's great. Um, mate, I've dived. Oh, crikey, that bloody island off San Diego. I should know it. I've, I've lost it. I've been out there where Terry Mars wrote about the, the white sea bass. I've had a dive there. Never saw a white sea bass, but I've shot, you know, the big sheep's heads and stuff. That was fun. I've dived. Yeah, cool. New Cali. Um, where, oh, and mate, what's that That little um, island across the ditch from us? On oh, New Zealand. Yeah, that, that's it. Yeah, where they talk. There's a couple of islands. Yeah. I had a great trip there. I dived to Nationals there. Um, ah, your choice. And uh, <laughs> Tyrell, yeah, choice, choice bro. <laughs> they, mate, they looked after me. They gave me a, a sole caravan that hadn't been lifted in 40 years. Possums were coming down every morning <laughs> trying to steal my breakfast. It's more um, than you deserve. Sorry, mate, it was mate. great. had a great time. Speed of snap at 10 and a half kilos. Yeah. Uh, oh, wow. Had a, yeah, had a ball. It wasn't bad for a Sydney kid. Um, yeah, awesome. So, mate, I, I, the Alderman Islands, mate, I've got a soft spot for. Uh, where else? So, mate, I've pretty much dived every state in Australia, but overseas, mate, not all that much. Not all that much. <laughs> But yeah, um, okay. I'd like to think I will be doing more in a few years' time when the kids get yeah. a bit older. 
Looking forward to seeing some photos in SDM ma- uh, magazine already. Now we like to we like to do a section on the show called Veterans Vault, and basically we like to ask our, our um, expert or authority or character what what they'd like to talk about, what they'd like to um, sort of communicate to our audience, and perhaps give them some actionable steps or uh, information to go away with. All right, I'll I'll start this. I've jotted a few things down. I think advice first and foremost. So find yourself a good retailer. So, and someone that's going to sell you a spear gun and a wetsuit that actually uses a spear gun and a wetsuit. Uh, and I think build a good relationship with those people. Face-to-face contact is fantastic with that. Can't recommend it highly enough. We're lucky in Sydney. We've got two or three guys who are fantastic for it. I think then that good retailer should be selling you good gear. You need to have some good gear. If you buy wisely now, it's going to save you a lot of money in the future. So don't buy a $100 pop gun when in six months' time from watching YouTube tutorials on how to spearfish or coming to do courses, you'll want a 1.3 Rob Allen or 1.1 Rob Allen, whatever. Mm. Sorry yeah. for naming brands, but, you know, that seems to be the generic. No, that's doesn't. fine. But, um, you know, whatever's horses for courses in your area, you realise, shit, I, I've just spent $500 on a gun that's just too big for me, a 1.4 won't work, or, yeah. geez, this 90 centimetre cray basher I bought and just uh, I want to go and shoot Spanish now I need a 1.4 so get good gear and take the retailer's advice and then I've said here again take advice again find a club or get on Facebook and find blokes there's plenty of forums out there get on there make mates with them don't be a goose don't think don't be a dickhead uh, carry on I know it all I can't yeah. stand people that come and want to learn but they're telling me how to spearfish yeah. I kind of have an idea. I still am learning, but you've come here to ask me questions. How about you let me tell you a couple of answers? So take advice, take it on board and try it out. The other thing is do a course. If you, if, if you can afford it, if you can do it, if you've got the time, do a course, free diving course, spearfishing course, someone who's knowledgeable, who's accredited, not just a fly-by-nighter that has an idea on spearfishing helps and just learn your breathing, which is great. I think that's important, just learn your breathing. And as my father told me when I, you know, used to ring him up and just say, Dad, how could you ever dive out the front of North Head? That's, you know, a long way. And he just used to say a five-letter word, relax. Yeah. You know, relax. It took me 15 years to understand what that word meant. Relax, man. That's, that's just the key thing. That's, that's probably my best advice, Relax. Some days it's hard too, isn't it? Like um, if you, if like one bit of your kit's sort of out of, out of line, sometimes I find it very hard to relax or you, you get a couple of combination of factors like dirty water or, or swell or something like that. Um, and, and it's harder when you're starting out too, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Mate, when I, when I started, like, mate, I, I, a lot of self-belief issues when I was a kid, just not strong enough. I kept coming up with excuses, troubles, equalising, Terrible shot. It went always seasick whenever I went out in the boat. And just you persevered? Overcome. Yeah, mate. Yeah, I did. Call me a fool, but I did. Just Never a heard. quick question, Simon. I suffer from seasickness terribly. Like, I mean, really bad. Besides seasick pills, mate, is anything? Yeah, mate, good? I got told a good cure the other day, and that was yeah. uh, to sit under a tree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Really bad. Oh, it's just something, mate. I knew I'd, I'd finally conquered it. I was coming back on that. The, uh, the rocky ship booby bird from a coral sea trip. There were 22 of us or something. There are only three bikes playing cards with me and they were all professional abalone divers. Oh, wow. Um, and I kind of looked around while I was sipping on my rum and ice and I said, you know what? I, I don't get seasick anymore. I was I'm pretty a, impressed I'm with a, that. I'm a scurvy sea dog now. Uh, mate, it's just, it's just time on the water. Yeah. So you know, I'll, don't, I'll don't start fix playing this. cards and drinking rum next time I go out. Yeah, just get in the water as soon as you can. But you have all your gear on, your mask around your neck and everything. As soon as the boat pulls up, if your mate's understanding, just jump straight in and just swim. Right. You, you don't get sick in the water. Excellent. Okay. I won't be boat boy first time. That's a good excuse. Yeah, yeah no, good call. <laughs> all right, so f- from your Fast Five Facts, i got good gear, take advice, find a good retailer, reputable retailer. Uh, number two was, again, find good advice and join a club or find a good mentor, find a good community to get involved with and learn the yeah, ropes yeah. and don't be a dickhead. Yeah. Uh, number three was do, do a course with a reputable um, mob or a yeah. reputable person. Number yeah. four was learn, learn your breathing, get that right. And number five was just relax and uh, 
and 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 like you sort of suggested, there was there's you learn more and more about relaxing as you go on. It's it's an ever- oh, you, you do, mate. I just had so many fears and like you know sharks. You know, you just when I was diving as a young bloke, mate, like you you swam by yourself for like you, you jumped in the water with two blokes, but you never saw them. Yeah, um, yeah. or rarely did. And my best buddy now, um, who's still my best mate, he lives in Coffs. It's funny we we go out, we dive, and you know we dive with other blokes, and we buddy up now because it's just the safer thing to do. But years ago, we'd be we'd find each other at the same location. You just had that same instinct of you'd be on that same drop off, and you just look at each other and laugh, and just go, "What are you doing here? What are you doing here?" You'd find the fish. Yeah, it was, it was always good fun uh, diving with him. Yeah, mate, that, that's the fast five, yeah. Oh, that's five good bits of actionable advice for our, for our audience. Um, yeah, the, the other big part of the show is the Veterans Vault. It's where we ask our um, expert or authority to take us deep into an area of passion or expertise they wanted to talk about. What, what did you want to discuss today with our, with our audience, Simon? When I went started to do my uh, freediving instructor certificate with a res Betis who's up in Air Australia, I was a spear fisherman and been diving for 25 years or something. And my mate, Andrew Harvey, had been diving for 20 years. We wanted to do it for ethics. That's why we wanted a ticket so we could start a little, be accredited, be able to have insurance. And just talk ethics to blokes. Don't shoot blue groper. You know, this is New South Wales. You can't shoot them. Don't shoot over your bag limit of moeys. You know, just take what you need, that yeah. type of stuff. And uh, the funny thing was the res was in the Gold Coast. We were in Sydney. And it took us about 18 months to get the full ticket. We had to do A, B, C courses and then the instructor's course. And it cost us a fortune besides the point. But after 20 minutes of sitting down at a res, we're kicking each other under the table and going, man, is that why we're doing that? Man, is that why I feel like that in the water? Or is that why I'm struggling at times? Wow. And yeah, yeah. And, but, and, and in that 18 months, we had three young blokes die. Wow. From blackout. And this has never occurred, really. I only knew of one guy that had blacked out before in a swimming pool. He was training by himself. And I think the first three deaths, two were from swimming pools. And one was from some young bloke off the sunny coast in 14 metres of water, diving with two or three other mates. And then it, it, it's gone on from there. Um, so blackout is, is what I want to talk about. And so much so blackout, but just resting on the surface and understanding your breath and listening to your body and understanding symptoms um been a big issue because there's been over 20 guys pass away in the last what eight seven eight years I, i've stopped record i stopped records at 18 um i just got too upset yeah. with it all and every one of these guys these young guys these fit young blokes would have been alive today if they dived with a partner watching it And then the second thing is not just a partner. There's no point diving 15 metres if your partner can only dive five. Because what's he going to do? Dive five metres and shoot you in the leg and take a long shot and try and pull you up? That has occurred overseas and the guy's the luckiest SOB alive that that's happened with. He was resuscitated and came back. But, you know, I know for a fact if you get nervous and upset, half your dive rate goes straight away because you're not relaxed, you're tense. So if you find a mate five minutes later who's lying on the bottom, you're going to struggle to get down there sometimes. I'm not saying that for everyone. But yeah, there was a lucky fellow from Victoria found in Eden uh, in June preparing for the, the big competition they have down there. Some uh, ab diver who they were diving with out of the boat happened to be swimming past, finds him on the bottom. He, uh, I think he was down for two or three minutes at 11 metres, 14 metres. I'm not sure of the depth. Wow. But he was resuscitated. He was out for a long time, many, many minutes. Wow. I, I can't be sure of the exact amount. He is lucky. Yeah. He will never win lotto. He's used up all his luck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, dive with a partner. Dive with someone who, who is at least as good as you. And if he's not, only dive to what that partner is comfortable diving at. It, it's a big thing. And the, the big third thing I like to ram home too, guys, and some people in remote parts of Australia will scoff at me, is just use a record and a float. In Sydney, you can't afford not to. You'll get knocked over by a boat. I've had two mates hit by boats, both horrible accidents. Uh, it, it's it's a life-changing thing, not just for you but, but your whole family. Yeah. Um, and need I say more about the blackout? But the key thing is with the blackout is just be aware what hyperventilation is. 80% of my students do it. 
oh, when I ask the question, what is hyperventilation? Give me a practical demonstration of the breathing. Or I might ask, how do you breathe up before you go for a dive? 80% of them are hyperventilating. Yeah, wow. Um, and the few that don't have been told by a good mentor about what proper breathing is. Mm. So find out what proper breathing is. Yeah, um, and it's so easy to get in the trick of hyperventilation. Hyperventilation is anything that's um, above and beyond your your normal breathing. How you're sitting down now, breathing basically. Now, b- before the show, you were sort of sharing your alarm with the the sheer volume of kind of information that's available yeah. online. I mean, there's YouTube videos and Vimeo videos about how to breathe up, and a, a lot of the information is wrong. Some of it's okay, but Ideally, would you recommend people sort of learn breathing training at a live event with with someone who can say yay or nay, you're doing the right thing or you're not? Oh, wholly and solely. I really do. And that's not just I'm not being biased because I, I run courses. I don't, I don't run freediving courses. I do, I do spearfishing only because that's, that's my passion. But wholly and solely, I, I think it's important. Too many people say if you dive at your 50%, you'll be fine. But your 50% differs day to day. If you're like me, that after Mindel Beach Casino, you're hung over, your 50% is 10% of what you normally do, yeah? Yeah. So you've got no idea. You can't push yourself. People call spearfishing an extreme sport. I argue that it's not an extreme sport. Because in extreme sports, you have parachutes, knee guards, <laughs> helmets, all safety equipment. Spearfishing, the only safety equipment you've got, it's, and it's not your dive watch, not your bloody dive watch, it's your partner. That's the thing. So, of course, it's good having um, someone who knows what they're talking about and can sit down and explain it to you. It's important. I cringe at some of the stuff I see on YouTube. I cringe at some of the stuff I hear on Facebook and advice that's given. I quite often privately message those people and go, listen, this is how it really is. Call me. Happy to talk to you. I I was looking around the other day uh, for some good video content to put on our website to help just uh, with a get, get started guide. And what alarmed me was I read a how to get started spearfishing um, video and, and this guy dives down to about 35 metres, lays on the bottom for about a minute and a half, I think, and like wow. three, three minutes into the video, this is a how-to video, I'm thinking, uh, well, uh, <laughs> I, I don't, most of the guys that are, even the experienced guys I know don't dive like this and you'd never, ever in a million years recommend it to a guy just starting out. And uh, that, that scared me a bit. Oh, <laughs> there's two or three divers now that have come to my mind that take guys, were taking guys out because they're phenomenal athletes and expecting their mates to do the same. Um, everyone is physiologically different. So what some can do and say, follow me, this is what I do, they can't do it because their makeup of their body is different. Mm. Um, Pippin Ferraris was a classic example of that. And his, the guys that trained with him, they couldn't do what he could do. Guys that come to me, they come to a course and say, I can hold my breath for three minutes. And I get them in the pool. I go through a fantastic breathing routine with them over several breath holds in a pool doing static. And they do half of their breath hold. And it's because they're not relaxed, they're stressed. And they say, I want to do it again. And I say, well, you won't do half of that again. And quite often they don't. Um, they say, well, this is how I do it. This is how I've always done it. It's just they don't want to listen to the advice. And I'm coming back to that. Other guys who say they've held their breath for a minute, I've got them holding it in the pool for five. Yeah. Wow. But then the next day when I've got them in the ocean, open ocean, that's choppy, that's 18 degrees, not 32 degrees in the pool, heated pool, mm. yeah, current, everything else, those guys that hold it for five minutes and that guy that holds it normally for three, First up, it takes them half a dozen, 10 dives to get comfortable and relaxed, yeah? And they're never going to hold their breath that long. They're lucky to hold their breath for a minute and a half. Yeah. Uh, mm. I normally don't let them hold their breath that long. Yeah. It's static. It, it's about responsibility as well you've got to these these guys. It brings us kind of neatly to the, the end of the, the interview, Simon, and we've got a lot of value so far. I, I wanted to um, give you the opportunity to, to give your courses a bit of a punt. Um, I, I know you didn't didn't request it or anything like that, but um, I think there'd be a lot of value in it for our audience. Um, so how often do you run these spearfishing workshops and, and whereabouts do you do them? Uh, mate, I, I really only do them in Sydney or within a couple of hours' drive of Sydney. Um, I've had boys fly in and out 
to come and do them and the, everyone's happy with them. I'll, I'll give myself a wrap there and Andrew. Andrew's would be one of my partner and it, it'd be, if he's not number one, he'd be number two in Australia for fish speed over 30 kilos in the country. He'd probably give old Barry Paxman a run, I'd say. He's, he's mm-hmm. pretty damn good on big fish. And so his knowledge alone is, is phenomenal. How big a group do you need to kick off right. one of your workshops? Mate, four, four divers, one instructor. I mean, if Andrew and I do it, so eight max, and we don't, we don't prescribe any more than that. We tailor it. If you're a newbie, whether I've got newbies and very experienced guys, we can work around with the four blokes and give them different routines and exercises in the water and out of the pool as well. We run them out of uh, frog dive at Willoughby, the theory class, that's theory one day. Day two is practical. We're called the Australian Spearfishing Academy. If you don't want to come to Sydney and you're in other states, Apnea Australia, that's Erez Betis is the principal instructor there and uh, diver. He is phenomenal. I can't speak highly enough of him as a free diver and as a bloke. Um, you'll see him a fair bit. He's in Tonga half the year these days. He's spoiled taking <laughs> tilts over there, diving with whales, etc. He's a spear fisherman at heart as well, as well as a former free dive record holder. Um, he's very, very knowledgeable. You can track him down and he practically travels over, over Australia to come to you if you can get six or eight blokes who will come to you. Okay. Pretty much. He's based in Sydney at the moment. He's a bit of a gypsy. He travels all around Australia. Fantastic. Well, that just about wraps it up, Simon. Thanks so much for coming in and, and talking to us. Um, yeah, it's been so much content and, and such a huge value. Um, is there anything else you want to add? No, nah, just relax, guys. No, nah, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I've enjoyed it a lot. I didn't know what to expect. Uh, and I'd love to come up your way or if ever you're down to Sydney, have a dive with me. Yeah, um, sounds good. Have a dive with you blokes and, and have a bit of fun. It's all about fun at the end of the day. Yeah. Any more parting Kiwi jokes or anything before you go? Uh, Don't want to make any comments about Queensland as, as a footballers or anything? Uh, mate, we can't, I can't afford to bait Kiwis. You're too good at rugby. When I was over there for the Nationals, we were cheeky because we were winning everything. But uh, that was a long time ago. Uh, mate, no, I'll, I'll leave you guys. Oh, oh, how do New Zealanders find sheep and long grass? Go on. Go on. Absolutely delightful. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right, man. I love it. Well, thanks, Simon. Cheers, lads. Thanks, heaps. Thanks, Simon. Bye. Cheers. Thanks for listening today, Noob Spiro. If you'd like to find out any more information from today's guest, then head over to noobspiro.com. We really appreciate you guys as listeners. Without you, we couldn't do the show. So if you want to help us out, leave us a review on iTunes or head on over to noobspiro.com and uh, sign up for our newsletter. We won't send you crap. So that's all from us. A big hooroo. We hope to see you soon. Shrek over and out.